From a violent murder and lynching in 19th century Atlanta, to a grim discovery amidst an ever-growing modern neighbourhood in Houston, here are five disturbing tales from the state of Texas. This first tale comes from Atlanta, Texas. The year is 1891. John Lowe was a well-known planter, residing with his wife and two children, a young son and a two-year-old daughter. On the evening of Saturday, October 24th, 1891, he returned home to an empty house. After searching for his family and finding no trace of them, he ran out of the house, called for help, and a search party was formed. But it wasn't until the following morning that the fate of his family was revealed. At the bottom of a well sat outside of the low household was the planter's dead wife and baby daughter. His son was also down there with them, barely clinging to life. The young man was pulled from the well and it was then that he told his father, his neighbours and the sheriff about the events of the previous night. While his father was away, a man named Lee Lewis, who was an employee of John Lowe, entered the family home brandishing a shotgun. He approached Mrs Lowe and demanded that she hand over all the money the family had. When she refused, Lewis riddled her with buckshot. Mrs Lowe, still alive and attempting to escape, was chased down by Lewis, who had by now grabbed her husband's Winchester rifle from the ward. He shot her through the heart and carried her body to the well outside. He dropped her in, and then returned to the house, where he heard the two-year-old girl crying. He snatched the Lowe's daughter from her cradle, took her outside, and threw her into the well on top of her mother. When the boy, who until now had managed to hide from Lewis, began to cry and call for help, he was chased from the house. Trying to escape his pursuer, who was now wielding an axe, he ran to the well and threw himself in. Lee Lewis then took an iron pot from the house and threw it on top of the boy, followed by large stones. Satisfied that the boy was dead, Lewis fled the scene. After hearing about what had happened, a search party was formed and Lewis was eventually tracked down to Kildare, 13 miles south of Atlanta. When he was captured, the sheriff took charge of his prisoner and threw him into a cell to save him from being lynched by the angry mob. At 2am the following Monday, not willing to accept the murderer's easy treatment, a gang of armed men from Atlanta forced their way into the jail, taking the keys from the guards. They dragged Lewis from the cell and took him to the low household, where he confessed to the murders. It was decided by all that hanging was too good for Lee Lewis, and all agreed that he would be burned at the stake. More than a thousand people gathered to witness a lynching and to help gather dried wood. A tall stake was driven into the ground, and the wood was piled up four feet high at the foot of it. Lewis was then bound to the stake, and the fire was lit. His begs for forgiveness were met with curses from the crowd, and as the flames grew higher, Lee Lewis was lost in the smoke and flames. His body was reduced to ashes. It was 10.30am on the morning of June 27th, 1930, as Mrs Eva Payne drove along Line Avenue in Amarillo in her husband's Durant Coupe, with their son, 11-year-old Alfred Payne Jr. She had driven just a few blocks from their home when smoke began to fill the car. Moments later the car exploded, seriously injuring Alfred Jr. and killing his mother, who was thrown to the sidewalk. There her badly mangled body was found, surrounded by shattered glass from nearby buildings. When an ambulance arrived, they found Alfred Jr. sitting against an alley fence, 30 yards from the car, crying. His clothes had been burnt, and the skin on the left side of his face and arm had been torn away. His father, 38-year-old Alfred Payne Sr., a respected attorney, was at his office when he heard the ambulance pass by. Shortly after, he received a phone call telling him that his wife was dead, and his son probably wouldn't survive. A client of his then drove him to the scene of the explosion. 
He was said to have shown little emotion when faced with the mangled figure of his wife, and told police officers that his son had recently played with firecrackers, and had boasted about his plans to use dynamite instead of fireworks on the 4th of July. He probably carelessly left some about the car, he said. When the police investigated the incident, they found that the car, which had cleared the curb and sidewalk, crashing into a house, still had its engine intact. It was found that three sticks of dynamite, placed under the driver's seat, had been detonated by what was described as a crude but infernal machine. Alfred Payne Sr. offered a reward of around $1,000 for any information on the death of his wife and attempt on his son's life. When police failed to find any leads, he turned to the editor of the Amarillo News Globe, Gene Howe, asking that he carry out an independent investigation. As a matter of fact, the newspaper was already well and truly on the case, with the help of journalist A.B. MacDonald of the Kansas City Star. During Gene Howe's investigation, he spoke to Alfred Payne's secretary, Verona Thompson. The young woman claimed that she and Alfred were having an affair, and that he was going to marry her once he had taken care of his wife. If Alfred Payne's cover wasn't unravelling fast enough at this point, Gene Howe and his team soon discovered that Payne had been romantically involved with a number of other women in the city, and had not only taken out a life insurance policy on his wife, but his son and eldest daughter too, the previous year. In less than three days, a case that still had the Amarillo police scratching their heads was all but solved by journalists Jean Howell and A.B. MacDonald. On the morning of August 5th, they presented their findings to the mayor and district attorney. That same day, Alfred Payne was arrested, along with his secretary, Verona Thompson. However, she ultimately only served as a witness and was later released without charge. When two of the three Payne children were interviewed, Alfred Jr. said that their father had walked to work on the fateful day, taking his youngest daughter with him. The older daughter had a play date that morning, leaving only Eva and Alfred Jr. with the car. Alfred Payne Jr.'s version of events was damning, and put his father even more clearly in the frame when he explained what had happened before the explosion. He said that when smoke began to fill the car, his mother turned to him and said, Daddy told me to drive faster when the car smokes like that, so that the wind will whip it out. Moments after she accelerated, the Durant Coupe exploded. Alfred Payne Sr. was arrested, but denied any involvement. By the time he was taken into custody, he had two identical letters on him, stamped and addressed. One to the sheriff, and the other to the chief of police. In the letters he claimed that an underworld informant had told him that a gang of what he called safe blowers had killed his wife by mistake, rigging the wrong car with dynamite. This last minute attempt at freedom was of no consequence, and Alfred Payne was locked up, ready to stand trial. On August 9th, 1930, he wrote a 63-page confession from his cell at the Hutchinson County Jail. In it, he admitted to the murder of his wife and attempted murder of his son. He also claimed to be communicating with his wife through the spirit world, and said that he had seen her in his room on the night of July 7th, describing her mangled and twisted body as she stooped in the doorway. However, he waived all efforts to commit him as insane, and begged to be sentenced to death by electric chair. He also penned a strange, taunting letter to journalists Gene Howe and A.B. MacDonald. He wrote, If there is any delay in my trip to the electric chair, it will be the fault of the state of Texas, and will be over my protest. For I want to go as quickly as the law will allow me to go. And I want to say further, although I am a nervous man, if you two will come to Huntsville and see me electrocuted, you will be more scared of seeing me die than I will be in dying. Payne was eventually moved to a cell in Potter County, and on Saturday, August 29th, 1930, the same day he was found guilty of murder, he had a brief, emotional visit from his eldest daughter and now crippled son. A little before midnight that same day, he said goodnight to his cellmates and walked to another part of the jail. There, alone in a cell, he laid down and ignited nitroglycerine. As well as obliterating his body, the blast shattered the cell, 
and damaged a large portion of the prison wall. Law enforcement have always been at a loss as to how he managed to obtain and conceal the explosives. Alfred Payne claimed to be a direct descendant of John Howard Payne, who wrote the 1823 song Home Sweet Home, and requested that the song be sung at his funeral. He also expressed his wishes to be buried next to his wife, but this was not granted. She was buried at Memorial Park Cemetery in Amarillo, and he 50 miles south at Rose Hill Cemetery in Tulia. The entire story of Alfred Day Payne's crime was chronicled by Harry Montgomery in his 1930 book Destruction, The Strange Case of A.D. Payne. Sixty-seven-year-old John Parks was said to be a reclusive man with few associates. He lived in an apartment in Houston with his mother, Anne Morgan. John had cared for the elderly woman since the early 1970s. Prior to this, she shared the apartment with her brother, that is, until he shot himself dead inside their home. That's when John took over his mother's care, and being the protective son he was, dedicated little time to anything else. The only family member they kept in regular contact with was John's brother, Carl, who lived in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. In mid-October of 1986, John wrote to Carl telling him that their mother was doing well and that she was grateful to have someone there to care for her full time. At this stage, though, it had been almost two years since Anne Morgan was seen by anyone else outside of her home, and a week after John's correspondence with his brother, the Texas Department of Human Services received an anonymous claim that Anne Morgan was being neglected. That same week, a welfare worker by the name of Laura Friedman paid a visit to the apartment. John Parks was furious at the intrusion, told Miss Friedman to leave, and threatened her with a cane. However, she eventually persuaded him to let her in. On entering the property, Miss Friedman saw Anne Morgan sat in a rocking chair in the small living room. She was unable to get a clear look at her because she was partially obstructed by blankets hanging from a clothesline. Unsatisfied but not wanting to put herself in further danger, Miss Friedman left. She then secured a court order to re-enter the home at a later date. A week later, on Wednesday, October 29th, this time accompanied by police officers, she returned. After letting themselves in, they were faced with the long dead body of Anne Morgan. She was propped up in the same rocking chair. Her virtually mummified corpse was dressed in only a nightgown and rubber boots. Moving through the living space to the bedroom, police found John Parks sprawled out on a bed with a single gunshot wound to his head and a 38 caliber pistol in his hand. It's believed that following the death of his mother, who would have been 89 at this point, John Parks went into shock, and unable to face living without her, he left Anne Morgan in the same spot she had died, which the medical examiner said could have been as long as two years ago. According to neighbours, Laura Friedman from the Department of Human Services was probably the first person allowed to enter the home in ten years. The autopsies were carried out on Thursday, October 30th. John's death was ruled a clear suicide, while his mother's death was not determined. However, the medical examiner strongly believed it to be a natural cause, as there was no signs of trauma, but couldn't understand why her body had mummified. Sergeant J.C. Mosier, who was among those who found the pair, said, She's almost totally mummified. For whatever reason, she didn't decompose. There certainly was a lot of deterioration, but not like you'd think. The sergeant also exclaimed that the scenario was similar to the film Psycho. She looked very much like Mrs Bates to me, if you've seen the movie. That's the first thing I've thought of. John's brother, Carl, mentioned that he and other family members often requested to speak to Anne, but were always ignored or sent away. He said, They loved one another, and he had lived with her most of his life. I'm sure he couldn't cope with the fact that she was gone after all these years. I'm just sorry that we didn't know in time. A calendar hung on the wall of the now empty apartment. 
The last entry was dated September 22, 1986. It simply read, Picnic with Mama. The Houston Heights in central Harris County, Houston, has been described as a historic neighbourhood. Over the years, like many other communities, it has seen a large number of old houses swept aside to make way for modern buildings and apartments. One of the older buildings still standing is this 1930s bungalow, once belonging to 61-year-old Mary Ceruti. Miss Ceruti bought number 610 Alston Street in 2001, but became frustrated with the development of modern housing. Over a number of years, she made a record of the ever-changing face of the old neighbourhood she once knew, and in February of 2013, she eventually voiced her concerns to the Houston Planning Commission, after work began on an apartment complex directly behind her own home. Her pleas were not taken seriously though, and nothing changed. In fact, things got worse. As the builders moved in, construction equipment often blocked her driveway, and at one point her water supply was even cut off. Then in 2015, she disappeared. Having heard nothing from her for some time, one concerned neighbour called the police, after she noticed that one of Mary's windows had been smashed, and mail had begun to pile up outside. When police entered the house on a welfare visit, they were met with a rancid odour, they found that six of the eight cats Mary owned were dead, and attributed the smell to them, but Mary was nowhere to be seen. It was assumed by some that the distress caused by the new construction, and the high probability that she would lose her house drove her away. The last time Mary was reported to have been seen was in March of 2015. At around the same time her bank filed a petition for foreclosure on the property, as she had defaulted on a number of mortgage repayments. The judgment for the foreclosure was signed on September 25th the same year. On September 28th, a missing persons notice was put out by the Houston Police Department, but there was no immediate investigation. Neighbours did attempt to make an official missing persons report, but were turned away because they were not related or thought to be closely associated with Mary. Her house sold at auction on November 3rd, 2015, for the sum of $261,000 to a property developer who modernised the building and put it up for rent. In May of 2017, new tenants Mr and Mrs Mueller moved in. One day as he explored his new home, Mr Mueller ventured into the attic. After moving some boxes, he noticed that a single floorboard, measuring around 8 inches in width, had fallen into a space behind the wall of the bathroom below. As he peered down into the space, he was shocked to see what looked like a human skull, surrounded by dirt and rubble. Looking closer, he noticed other bones scattered around, as well as items of clothing. Mr Mueller was so worried about telling his wife about what he had found, that he waited a full day before calling 911. What is your emergency? Uh, so, it's, I just called to report this, I didn't know exactly how to do it, but I just moved into this house. And I found between two of the walls, uh, I found a human skeleton. Did you find the head or the whole body, Mr. Muller? There's more than just the head. It looks it's like a more than skeleton. the head. We have emergency units dispatched to your location. When police arrived and began pulling the human remains from the ward, along with a pair of tennis shoes, glasses and other items of clothing, it was decided that Mary, if that's who it was, had been the victim of a tragic accident falling through the floorboard in the attic and dying in the wall cavity. But her neighbour Roxanne Davis questioned the theory. In 2018 she told local TV channel KHOU, Mary was certainly very frail, but it's hard for me to believe that a person could step on a board and their entire body would go down a crack that is two inches wider than a dollar bill. Police said that there was no sign of foul play, but admitted they didn't have much to work with, as the bones were so badly damaged. The autopsy report stated that because the remains were partially eaten by rodents, the cause of death was impossible to find, and was listed as undetermined. A cousin of Mary's, a woman by the name of Nancy Stewart Stoddart from Amarillo, 
came forward following the discovery. She had recently attempted to find Mary through a family genealogy project, but instead came across the missing persons poster online. So instead of reconnecting with her long-lost cousin as she had hoped, Nancy Stoddart found herself giving a DNA sample to police for analysis. That sample was compared to DNA taken from the teeth of the unidentified body. Everybody involved in the case thought it was likely that a match would be made, but when the results were revealed in February of 2018, and there was no match, police were only left with circumstantial evidence. A spokesperson for the Harris County Medical Examiner's Office, Tricia Bentley, stated that it was not uncommon for DNA between cousins to not match, and more time would be needed to confirm an identity with the help of other evidence. The medical examiner, Sharon Derrick, reported that after the bones were tested, they were said to have belonged to a woman over the age of 40. She also pointed out that in the 2013 video of Mary speaking to the Houston Planning Commission, Mary appeared to have difficulty moving her jaw when she spoke. To the medical examiner, it appeared slow and laboured, a condition she said matched the way the jawbone fitted the skull. This, along with the fact that the glasses found next to the skeleton were strikingly similar to those worn by Mary Ceruti, was enough, according to the Houston Police Department, to give a comprehensive identification. As far as they were concerned, Mary had been found, and the case was closed. Not everyone shared that same conviction, though, and some neighbours, including Roxanne Davis, still believed that murder was a strong possibility. In the small town of Venus, 30 miles southwest of Fort Worth, lived a man named Freddie Mack. He occupied two and a half acres of fenced off land and a trailer home, which he shared with his 18 dogs. According to reports, he was registered as disabled, suffered with seizures, as well as other physical conditions, and in recent years had rarely ventured out or spoke to his family. The main reason given for this was his dogs, Described only as crossbred, the dogs were said to be aggressive and made it difficult for family or anyone else to check up on the 57-year-old. Deputy officers were faced with the same problem when on May the 6th, 2019, they paid a visit to the home on a welfare check. Mac, who hadn't been seen or heard from since April 19th, was reported missing by his family. The officers eventually managed to distract the dogs long enough to search a small portion of the land where they found no sign of Mr. Mack. They returned three days later on May the 9th, with a drone, which they used to survey the area without fear of attack. Still, there was no sign of the occupant. The next day, Freddie Mack was registered as a missing person, and a warrant was issued to remove the dogs to allow the police a thorough search. By this time, only 16 dogs remained, two of them having been killed by the others. This search began on May the 15th and continued for several days. Again, having failed to locate Freddy or find any clues to his whereabouts, the deputy's attention was drawn to the long grass around the property. In the grass they found dog feces containing human hair, clothing and small fragments of bone. The strands of clothing did match those said to be worn by Freddy, but needing to be sure, police sent the bone fragments to the University of North Texas for a DNA analysis. On Tuesday, July 9th, it was confirmed that the DNA matched that of Freddie Mac. It's unknown if the dogs killed Freddie first or if they'd eaten him after he died, but when the case came to a close, all that remained of Freddie Mac were a few two to five inch fragments of bone. Thirteen of the remaining sixteen dogs were euthanized due to their aggressive nature, and the remaining three were put up for adoption. Sheriff's Deputy Aaron Pitt said, Never have we, or anyone we've spoken to, heard of an entire human being consumed by dogs. The bones were completely broken up and eaten. Freddy's family told the press of how he loved his dogs, and would often sit outside the trailer home with them. He referred to them as his babies. <laughs> <laughs> 